Greetings, my name is Mark Daly. I'm an immigration lawyer with Pro Forma Immigration Attorneys. This is our seventh and final video in the series regarding how to file to get your spouse a green card when you're a U.S. citizen. We're talking about permanent residency for spouses. The step-by-step -step guide is for guiding you through USCIS immigration forms and documents and even the interview and even what happens after the interview. So the seventh video then, Adjustment of Status and Marriage Interview with USCIS. Let's go ahead and dive right in. For an introduction, this is the step-by-step -step immigration forms video series where you prepare your own documents, you prepare your own forms, and you submit them to me or our attorneys to review them in a two-hour consultation. So it's a low-cost way to have a lawyer take care of you and work on your case. Our other company is Pro Forma Immigration Attorneys. That's where you hand everything over to us and we become your attorneys. We enter the case with you and we walk with you through the whole case, usually a year, year and a half. We file everything and we work with you in a wide range of areas. Immigration for family, for business, detention and removal. The step-by-step -step is just the family stuff though. And so those are the two uh, programs we have. The third one is actually a immigration law training that I do for attorneys. Uh, all over the country, they contact me, they wanna learn immigration law. So I have a three-day intensive where they fly into Denver and we take them through either family or we can take them through business or we take the attorneys through detention and removal. And they walk out competent in an area of practice, which is great for them. And also I like to do, you know, uh, go around and do conferences, present on immigration topics at different conferences. This is the Federal Bar Association where I presented there. And in my background then, I, I'm a member of the State Bar of California and I've been a member since the year 2000. And I'm also American Immigration Lawyers Association member and I've been there for since I was in uh, 2000. And so that's my background, what I'm doing. I'm here to help you and we're going to start with the terms. Let's get the words right. Petitioner is the U.S. citizen. The beneficiary is the immigrant. The applicant is also going to be called. Uh, they're going to be called and that's the immigrant too. Now I-130, that form is for determining the good faith marriage. The I-485 is determining the immigrant inadmissibility. So those two things are what we're looking at as we go to this interview. They're going to be checking out the good faith marriage on one hand and they're gonna be talking about the immigrant's inadmissibility, their criminal background, their uh, public charge issues, all these different things to knock them out, knock them out of the race. That's the inadmissibility conversation. So those are the two conversations they're gonna be having in an interview. The burden of proof, 100% on you. You've gotta prove every aspect of the case. So like in the cover letter that we just showed you, all those are the categories that you need to prove, and each one of those you have to do. So there's no real assumption that, you know, for each one of those categories that you're, you're all good. In fact, it's just the opposite. They just assume that you're no good. So you have 100% to prove on you. Now, the standard of proof is a little different. The preponderance of the evidence is what the standard of proof is in immigration, and it's 51%, or more, li more likely than not, that each one of those things you're trying to prove is true. So public charge, where there's a whole thing on the public charge, you only need to show 51%. You don't need clear and convincing evidence, enough evidence to show that it's more likely than not that you will not be a public charge. So the standard of proof is important to know when you're going to your interview because you don't want them to harass you or tell you that you don't have enough proof when actually you do. So we're, what are we doing on this case? We're downloading your forms. We're getting your documents together. We're getting your information together. We're filling out the forms. We're assembling the forms. We're filing the forms, following up, and then we go to the interview, right? So we're at the interview now. Now, when we're talking about the interview, we never know quite how, when it's gonna come. We're gonna get a letter telling us when, it, when it's ready, about 30 days before the interview date, but up until then, they're not gonna communicate with us that much. So it could be hanging out there, what do we do? We go and we find out the local office information on the USCIS website to find out if we need to go in person to follow up with what's going on, the information is there on that. 
There's a case status button on the USCIS.gov homepage that you can put in your receipt notices and find out what's going on with your cases. Processing times are also published. I show you on the last one how to do that, but that's a way you can check in and see how things are going. And then you'll get your interview notice. And then at, when you get your interview notice, it's going to have a list of things to bring and do for your interview. So let's cover that right now. Okay, so here's an interview notice and request for an applicant to appear for initial interview. So this one's put together, it says a form I-485, application to register permanent residence or adjust status. Most of the time that's what they'll do. They won't put I-130 and I-485. They're going in for the green card and they'll list that. Sometimes they'll say an I-130 application, but most of the time it's gonna be 485 and it's gonna have the date the case was received and then the priority date, which is usually gonna be the same and the date of the notice here. So they're saying this was November 15th and the appointment is for January 23rd. So this one came well in advance, <coughs> like two months in advance. Now check this out. You're hereby notified to appear for the interview appointment as scheduled below for the completion of your application to register permanent residence or adjust status and any supporting applications or petitions. We do have a petition in there, we have an I-130. Failure to appear at this interview and or failure to bring below listed items result in the denial of your application. There it is. One and done. One and done. It's an act of grace for them to give you a, a request for evidence and give you more time to bring stuff. You need to show up for this interview with everything you need to get the deal done. Okay, who should come with you? If your eligibility is based on your marriage, your husband or wife must come with you to the interview. All right. If they don't come with you to the interview, then there's going to be a problem with that because you need to show you have a good faith marriage. And if they don't come, it pretty much just sinks your good your claim of having good faith marriage. So um, if you do not speak English fluently, you should bring an interpreter. Please bring an interpreter. Bring an interpreter. You don't want to have them say, you know what, you're not understanding it. I'm just going to have to reschedule this and have you bring an interpreter. Or worse, you, you're supposed to bring an interpreter and you didn't, so I'm going to deny your case. You can refile it and start over again from scratch when you get your interpreter. Right? So bring an interpreter. And it can be a family member, it can be a friend, someone who just has to be fluent in both languages. They fill out a little form at the interview, they show their uh, ID, and they, they sign up as an interpreter for the interview. Your attorney or authorized representative may come with you to the interview. That's true, attorneys get to attend. If your eligibility is based on a parent-child relationship but the child's a minor, the petitioning parent and the child must appear for the interview. Note, every adult over ages of 18 who comes to the interview must bring government-issued photo ID, such as a driver's license or ID card, in order to enter the building and to verify his or her identity at the time of the interview. You do not need to bring your children unless otherwise instructed. Please be on time, but do not arrive more than 45 minutes early. We may record or videotape your interview. And uh, I would say I like to get there half an hour early. The, sometimes the lines are really long to get into the building because they have uh, security checks. Take off your shoes, take off your belt, your cell phone. The lines can get really long. So half an hour, showing up, ready to go, but half an hour before the appointment is a good idea. You must bring the following items with you. Please use it as a checklist to prepare for your interview. Okay, we will. This interview notice and your government issued photo ID. Got it. A completed medical examination, form I-693 and vaccination supplement in a sealed envelope, unless already submitted. The medical exams are good for one year. What did we see about the processing times? Up to two years. So if you've submitted your medical exam and it expired, guess what? You gotta bring another one. You gotta bring an updated one. Now check with your doctor because doctors will a lot of times do another updated exam for cheap. And so if that, that's cool when they do that. Uh, but either way, don't show up without a current good medical exam that's less than a year old. A completed affidavit of support with all required evidence, including the following for each of your sponsors. All right. Federal income tax returns and W-2s or certified IRS printouts for the past three years. Letters from each current employer, verifying current rate of pay and average weekly hours and pay stubs for the last two months. 
Evidence of your sponsors and co-sponsors, United States citizenship or lawful permanent resident status. So you've heard about this before, right? You get what's coming up. All right. Now, this does not talk about the I-944. We're going to assume that pretty soon they'll start printing these things with the I-944 with the bullet points of all the crap that they want you to bring for the I-944. All right. So heads up on that. All documentation establishing your eligibility for lawful permanent resident status, right? So what does that mean? Um, your eligibility for lawful permanent resident status, remember you gotta prove 100%. So if you have criminal convictions then obviously the criminal convictions are gonna be coming in. And then what is your evidence to show that you know you shouldn't be charged as a crime, as a criminal? You know, come bring in your arguments, come bring in all of your documents. Your, everything you need to prove your lawful permanent residence, you're gonna to need to bring, right? So also your entry, like how do we know that you got in? How do we know that you're here legally? You know, you need to bring all that stuff as well. And if you've got old deportation cases, bring all those cases, bring everything you need to establish your permanent residency, which is basically what you've submitted in the application. See, when we submit our applications, we submit um, so much information that when we show up at the interview a year later, we're just updating stuff. We're just bringing the updated uh, documents, forms, tax returns, more updated photos, that kind of stuff. But we set out the main case when we apply. So that's why we like to do it that way. We like to do a really good job when we first apply. So all the documentation establishing our eligibility for lawful permanent resident status is included in our application. Because what's true is that on the day you file, you need to qualify for your green card on that day. You need to have you know everything set for the day of filing, your priority date. At the interview date, they're gonna confirm everything, but it's gonna go back, it's gonna relate back to the date you first filed. So the best practice is to put together a really nice, even if it takes a little longer, put together a really nice package so that on that day, you know that you qualify for everything. Any immigration related documentation ever issued to you, including any employment authorization document, any authorization for advanced parole, all travel documents used to enter the United States, including passports, advanced parole documents, I-94s, your birth certificate, your petitioner's birth certificate, and your petitioner's evidence of U.S. citizenship or lawful permanent resident status. If you have children, bring a birth certificate, birth certificate for each of your children. If your eligibility is based on your marriage, in addition to your spouse coming to the interview with you, bring certified copy of your marriage document issued by the appropriate civil authority your spouse's birth certificate and your spouse's evidence of U.S. citizenship or lawful permanent resident status. If either of you or your spouse were ever married before, all divorce decrees, death certificates for each prior marriage or former spouse, birth certificates of all children in this marriage, and custody papers for your children and your spouse's children not living with you. Right? Supporting evidence of your relationship. There we go over the good faith marriage, such as copies of any documentation regarding joint assets or liabilities you and your spouse may have together. This may include tax returns, bank statements, insurance documents, car, life, health, property documents, car, house, etc., rental agreements, utility bills, credit cards, contracts, leases, photos, correspondence, and any other documents you may feel sus substantiate your relationship. All right. So this then, you know, um, you're going to bring updated documents from when you first submitted the documents. If you submitted the bank statements and all the photos and everything, here's what we're talking about, freshening stuff up. Proof of insurance, you're going to want to bring updated receipts. You're going to want to bring a whole new slew of this kind of evidence so that what you're doing is on the day of filing, you've got proof that shows you guys have a good faith marriage on this date. And then a year later, you're showing more proof of your good faith marriage. So that's how you give the best evidence in your case, is that you've got this whole year showing everything's been up and going. And that the weight of that evidence is probative and starts to really go to that 51% when you bookend your, your, your claim of uh, admissibility with this type of evidence. 
Original and copy of each supporting document that you submitted with your application. Original and copy, all right? Otherwise, we may keep your originals for our records. All right, here we go. If you have ever been arrested, bring the related police report and the original or certified final court disposition for each arrest, even if the charges have been dismissed or expunged. No court record. If no court record is available, bring a letter from the court with jurisdiction indicating this. They don't play with this. This is a real deal. So if you have a lot of criminal background and you want to get in the United States, you know, you're already, they're not going to like you, right? So you need to really do a good job in being upfront with bringing in all the documents from all the cases. And we're talking about arrest records from police departments that are original, that are certified. Court documents, original and certified. Everything has to be original. And if there are no records available, then the letter from the court has to be original and certified, right? So it's like a big deal. A certified English translation for each foreign language document. The translator must certify that she is fluent in both languages and that the translation in its entirety is complete and accurate. Now, I want to double back a little bit and talk about how to present this in your interview, okay? You want to use an accordion file. Let me show you what an accordion file looks like. Okay, here we go. This is a picture of an accordion file with the flap. So you see here the different slots where you're going to put all your documents in the same order as the interview notice. So the first thing it's talking about is your passport. So it goes here. Let me show you what I mean by that. So the interview notice is going to go in the front one. The medical exam is going to be next. Affidavit of support stuff next. And then your eligibility stuff going in. The good faith marriage down here. Uh, and all those are going to go into your accordion file in that order because that's where they're going to ask you for all your documents. Now, what all, what's also true is you want to print out a copy of your complete application and bring it with you to your interview because then you've got a copy of all those documents. Then you bring the originals with you, the marriage certificate, birth certificates, all the photos and everything, bring all the originals and that's going to go back here in these pockets. And then your updated forms are going to, your updated documents would also go at the very end because it's at the very end of the interview that they say, do you have anything else you want to give us? And then that's when you pile in the new documents. All right. So that's how I like to work the interview is actually doing it that way. Okay. You must appear for this interview. If an emergency such as your own illness or a close relative's hospitalization prevents you from appearing, call the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service and ask them customer service number. Yeah, that's right. You call first. Please be advised that rescheduling will delay processing of application or the petition and may require some steps to be repeated. It may also affect your eligibility for other immigration benefits while this application is pending. I like to call in. I also like to mail a copy to the district office here. The address here, mail it in there and ask them or tell them that you're not going to be showing up. It is horrible to get the denial letter for not showing up after you've called and some, some idiot didn't pass the message on. So I like to do it in writing. I like to actually do it certified mail when I want to reschedule or ask for a new uh, interview date um, because of whatever, travel or some ex exigent circumstance and I like to do it as far in advance as possible. Okay, so that's it with the interview notice. Now the next thing we want to cover is questions they may ask and may not ask because What's true is that they have to maintain professionalism in doing these interviews. And it is a very wide range of questions that they can ask you. Sometimes they might split you up and ask one spouse a set of questions, have them leave, take the other spouse in, ask them a set of questions and compare the answers, right? And if that happens, then you know, there's usually something that's flagged them in the application. Something that maybe the addresses are different, maybe there's no lease. Something in the application shows that there might be proof that they're not living together, they're not going out in public together, they're not sharing their money together, the family doesn't seem to know about the marriage, 
Some of these things may tip off an interviewer when they're looking through the application before you come in to say, we should split these guys up. So if they do split you up, then you know they can ask a lot of questions, but there are some questions that they should not ask. And there's an intuitive sense you're gonna get when an examiner is going overboard on an interview. And they start to ask about uh, you know, sexual things or inappropriate things like that, or they want to leverage you by saying, look, we know that um, you're, you're, this is a fraudulent marriage, so you should just admit to it right now because it's not real, and the other person has already told us, and they split you up and they start to you know, leverage one another. Your spouse has already told us that they're gonna file the divorce for you, so you should just go ahead and admit that uh, this is a fake marriage. If they come at you with that kind of stuff, you gotta go time out, and I wanna talk to a supervisor. I wanna to talk to a supervisor, and that's gonna slow and it'll stop everything, and then the supervisor will have to get in on it, and then the supervisor will give you some more information about what's really going on. Because there are inappropriate examiners that do weird stuff, and if that starts to happen with you, you wanna fight back, you wanna push back. You know, I've been in interviews, and they've even done weird stuff with me. Like, um, but it's like a training thing. Sometimes they're innocent and they just don't know it. Like here's an example. So I had a client, same sex marriage case. And my clients, um, these guys, they had been married to women before. And they're, now they're married to one another. And the examiner saw that and said, you guys cannot be a bona fide marriage because you've been married to women. And that was really offensive. They called me from the interview. They said, we're having a problem here. They're saying that uh, we can't have a good faith marriage because we're uh, bisexual. And I went, oh my goddess. All right, let's check this out. Put me on speakerphone. I got on there. I said, you cannot, this is a civil rights issue. You know, sexual preference is a protected class. The law says we can have same-sex marriages. So that's what they've got, a same-sex marriage. You can't go in there and say, because you're bisexual, I'm not gonna grant you the green card based on a claim of a same-sex marriage. That's not how it works. You've got to stop doing this. Um, and so, you know, that's an example then of someone who didn't really have the right training, I would you say that, but uh, we did go hard on that guy. I did contact the interviewer. I contacted the, uh, I mean, I contacted the district office and I talked to the uh, field office uh, you know, supervisor out there. And then I called Washington, D.C. and I brought it up with the, uh, you know, with the ombudsman office, which is the one in charge of any kinds of complaints. And of course we brought it up to our congressperson too, as well, the violation of civil rights that, were, that was happening. And we kept it like, well, you need training here. But at that point, you know, they, weren't, they hadn't approved the application yet, so we were coming really hard uh, with them and demanding that they approve the application. They eventually did, but this is the type of thing that can happen in our interview when an, ex an examiner goes overboard. Now, you know, with the new affidavit of support stuff and the 944, the, um, the self-sufficiency issues are gonna be really wiggly and they can go into anything and they can start to, you know, really grind you down with, oh, it looks like you don't have enough evidence. Oh, it looks like you don't have enough evidence. And that's gonna be really tricky for you to argue no, I've satisfied the preponderance of the evidence. I've, I've given you 51% of everything you've asked for, which qualifies me with a showing that I, I'm, I qualify for the benefit. So I am getting the benefit. I, I have done what I'm supposed to do. Now you're supposed to do what you do and give me the damn benefit. You know, there, there's um, some pushback that's gonna have to be required with a little more aggressiveness based on the attitudes of the examiners right now and the way the laws are written, which are giving them a lot of fuel for abusing due process uh, in the immigration context. So having said that, the questions they may ask, let's look at those. Okay, so here are, this is, this is posted on the website, step-by-step -step immigration forms. Here's a list of the questions USCIS may ask in an interview regarding a good faith marriage. One, 
any question appearing on any application that you have filed with the USCIS or the embassy. They expect you to know one another's residence, your work history, your parents' names, the children's names, and immigration dates and status. Okay, another one. When was the first time you met? All right. Oh, it was online, it was this, it was that. Make sure you guys have the same answers. Okay, how did you meet? All right, so these are open-ended questions. They're asking you open-ended to tell a story. All right, when was the first time you went on a date? Now that is a little more closed-ended because it's just asking for a day. And the rule of thumb here is that you don't wanna to give too much information. You wanna give just enough to answer the question. They want to get out of there as fast as possible. And sometimes they'll be actually looking through documents when they're asking you the questions. So when you're in an interview, make sure you just answer yes or no, if that's all they want. And if they ask an open-ended question, be very brief, right? So uh, that's, that's the best way to handle it. Give a lot of silence. Just keep your trap shut. Don't try to make friends with these guys. Just give them the information correctly if you don't know, say you don't know. If you need to check your application, say I need to double check my application, pull it out. Oh, my address five years ago was this. You know, Be real, be efficient, but don't make stuff up ever. But, and to have, these, to have this stuff figured out, know when your first date was. You know, know where you went on your first date. What was the last movie you saw together? What was the last holiday you spent together? When was the last time you went out to a restaurant together? Where did you go? Who were the last friends you had over to your house? When did they come? You were standing at the stove in your kitchen. Where's the refrigerator? How many television sets do you have in your home? What side of the bed do you sleep on? Now on this one, be careful. Decide if you're in the bed or looking at the bed. If you're in the bed, I'm gonna be, sitting on, I'm gonna be sleeping on the right side. My wife's on the left, but if I'm looking at the bed, I'm gonna be sleeping on the left side and my wife's gonna be sleeping on the right. So talk amongst yourselves, make sure you, you know what you're talking about. Sometimes you might just draw a little picture. You just go, we're well, here's the pillows here and here's the bed. And so I go on this side. And that's another way to do it. Just avoid the left and right conversation altogether. <laughs> or I sleep next to the wall, you know. What is the color of your spouse's toothbrush? Yes, that's a, that's a, a favorite. How does your spouse arrange their clothes in the closet? in the drawers. Okay, there's a little more tricky. But these are the types of questions that they may ask you. Finally, you can expect to get an approval notice or a denial notice or a request for evidence notice. Now, at the interview, they're not going to give you, they usually don't give you an approval notice right there at the interview. They have to go back and process it. The supervisor reviews it and then they give you the approval. They might give you a request for evidence right there. They might write one up by hand uh, and just say, we need to get another year of tax returns. We need a new medical exam for you. I need to get the certified copies of those criminals. And they might just write that up. Or they might say, we've got some stuff. We're gonna mail you a letter asking for more stuff, right? Uh, or it could be a denial, you know? You get a denial notice for, for these cases and they're gonna have information about how to appeal, how to file a motion to reopen or uh, you know, a motion to reconsider. And both of those are ones you're gonna to wanna to work with an attorney if you get a denial. And you're gonna to wanna to file that within 30 days. So you wanna really be on it uh, and do it quickly uh, or else you lose that opportunity. Um, you can file within 30 days and then give a bunch of documents later, but you can't miss that filing deadline. You know, and there's a fee, a filing fee associated with that and a form you gotta fill out. So. You got to make sure when you get a denial notice that you really call a lawyer and figure out what your strategy is going to be to, to uh, deal with that. But most of the time you'll get an approval notice and then that approval will include a, a green card and the green card will be good for two years. And at the end, right before the end of the two years, you got to refile. You got to file the I-751 and you got to file that conditional petition to remove the conditions on your permanent residency. And if you forget that and you blow that deadline, it's a real problem because you're gonna be put into removal proceedings and then you're gonna to have to file that in front of the immigration judge, which is a horrible thing to have to do. So that's it, you made it all the way through. Video seven, adjustment of status and marriage interview with USCIS.
So thanks so much for watching this series. We're gonna be doing two more series. We're gonna be doing a series with the fiance visa and also how to do this for processing at embassies. And of course, our website, Step-by-Step -Step Immigration Forms, you have the contact information there, how to get in touch with us, how to schedule the two-hour form and document review. In the, in the descriptions down below these videos, there's also links to how to get in touch with us, how to schedule 15-minute consultations, one-hour consultations. We work by Zoom, and we do uh, video consultations for people all over the world. And we can definitely help you. So thanks a lot. Thanks for watching.